My home lab has grown into something I depend on every day. And it's not just for VMs or backups. From self-hosted dashboards to media servers and network tools, I've tested dozens of services to figure out what's actually worth running. In this video, I'll show you the best services I've found so far, some of which have completely changed how I operate on a day-to-day -day basis. The first service that provides a ton of value is a syncing tool. These allow you to automatically sync data from a device to one or multiple other devices. This can be SyncThing, Synology Drive, Nextcloud, or more. From my experience, the way you'll get the most value out of this is by syncing data from the device that you're currently using to some sort of a central NAS, which allows you to fully automate a 3 to one backup. When you save a file, the file will automatically sync to your NAS and your NAS can be configured to automatically back up that data offsite. So the act of saving the file locally will immediately provide two copies of your data, one on your device and then the second on your NAS. Then that night, or really at whatever frequency you want, your NAS will back that data up to a cloud service like Backblaze B2 or something similar. Plus, depending on the file system you're using on your NAS, you can configure snapshots as well, which will provide even better data integrity. This means that every time you save a file, as long as syncing is working, you can be confident that the data is safe and you'll have multiple copies of it. The key here is that there are better and worse ways of doing this, depending on the total amount of storage that you have. For example, with SyncThing, the data can sync from one location to another. It's super easy to set up, and the syncing is technically a little more efficient because rather than syncing the data from your device to a NAS only, you can sync the data from a personal device to another personal device and your NAS. With this approach, the data is available quicker than it would be with something like Synology Drive or Nextcloud or really any similar tool. However, with SyncThing, you must have the available storage space on each device as full files are synced back and forth. So if you have 100 gigabytes of files, you'll store 100 gigabytes on each device that you configure with SyncThing. With tools like Synology Drive and Nextcloud, they utilize a feature called on-demand sync. With on-demand sync, a reference to the file is stored locally, but the entire file is not stored locally. This allows you to double click the reference to that file and download it from the NAS only if you need it. This allows you to have quick access to your data without having to store it locally, though for larger files, you will have to wait for the file to download. Overall, on-demand sync is a feature that I love, but it isn't needed for everyone. If you're working with small amounts of data, the storage needed might be minimal. And at that point, something like SyncThing might be a better option for you. The goal here is to really just ensure that the data you're working on ends up on the NAS so that you get the benefits of snapshots and offsite backups. But this is the exact workflow I've used for years and can't imagine using anything else because of how much it's helped me. The next service that's been extremely helpful is an internal reverse proxy server. Now, traditionally, reverse proxy servers are meant for external traffic. So you configure a reverse proxy server like Nginx, Nginx Proxy Manager, Traffic, Caddy, etc. And you can expose different internal services to the outside world with a valid SSL certificate while only having to port forward TCP port 443. These days, if you want an external reverse proxy server and it's not for media related files, I'd recommend using something like a Cloudflare tunnel. It functions the same way, has increased security since it doesn't require port forwarding. And I recently did a video on that, so I'll leave that in the description in case you're interested in checking that out. But why would you use an internal reverse proxy server? As time goes on, you'll be in a position where you're going to end up with a lot of internal services. And remembering the IP addresses for those services can get overwhelming. Of course, you can use a DNS server and DNS record that points to the service so that you can easily remember the name and access it. But what if you took it one step further and purchased a domain that you can use for internal services, got a valid wildcard SSL certificate, and then created a DNS record for each of your services? Following this approach, you'd be able to access the web service without having to remember the IP address or port and you'd have a valid SSL certificate, so no more annoying certificate errors. The SSL certificate will be renewed through DNS, so no open ports, and quite honestly, it's really not that hard to set up. There are easier and harder ways to do this, and I've tried a bunch of them and find Nginx Proxy Manager 
with a domain hosted on Cloudflare to be the absolute easiest. And I have a video on that that I'll link below if you're interested in checking it out. But from an accessibility perspective, this has been a game changer for me. And while that's my suggested approach, you don't have to do it this way. You can use just about any reverse proxy server you want, as long as you're able to get a wildcard certificate with it. And trust me, you'll be thrilled to no longer have to remember IPs or click through certificate errors. Next up is just about everything related to monitoring, as monitoring your self-hosted services becomes important when you have multiple. The first and easiest way to monitor your home lab is to use a dashboard paired with the internal reverse proxy server we just went over, which also provides an easy way to access all of your services. Home lab dashboards like HomeR, HomePage, or more can generally be configured to show if the service is online or offline. With this approach, you're able to see at a glance if specific services are offline directly on your dashboard, which ends up being a helpful way of ensuring that everything is online. But a more helpful way of ensuring everything is online is with an uptime monitor like Uptime Kuma. Uptime Kuma paired with notifications has become a very important part of my workflow, as there have been times where services have gone offline and I've known just about immediately that I have to see what's wrong if it's an unplanned outage. Uptime Kuma provides pure uptime monitoring, but what about server monitoring? This is where things can get a little tougher as uptime monitoring does not necessarily guarantee that the server is running optimally, as you can technically be low on storage, have high CPU or memory usage, etc. This is where tools like Bezel, Grafana and Prometheus and a few others allow you to monitor your servers and possibly even your network. I've been playing around with these a lot lately and hope to have a video on my favorite solution soon, but they're all popular options out there and you can explore any of them to see which works for you. With Uptime Kuma, you're monitoring for uptime, but with these tools, you're monitoring the servers themselves to ensure that they're running optimally as well. And if they're not, you will be notified. While monitoring is generally viewed as a boring topic, it's also the one area that you'll truly appreciate when you need it. And I think every home lab needs multiple ways of monitoring performance, infrastructure, and more. And these tools can help you get there. Similar to monitoring, but from a testing and validation perspective is network performance testing tools like OpenSpeedTest and iPerf3. These tools are similar, but different. OpenSpeedTest is designed with a simple user interface that can be run in a web browser and tests download, upload, and latency similar to online tests like speedtest.net. This helps troubleshoot performance issues either on a global scale in the event of a widespread issue or client performance issues if it's an isolated issue. This can be self-hosted in Docker and provides a quick way to test network performance, but when you're really looking to test network throughput, most people will put you towards iPerf3 iperf3 is a command line only tool that allows you to configure a server and test the network speeds from a client device if you're trying to diagnose bottlenecks between servers or network switches or even just validate that you're getting the correct throughput iperf3 is going to be your best bet in that area is your nas actually getting 10 gigabit speeds or does it have something to do with your rate array and that's why you're getting the greater performance iperf3 will help you answer those questions this, paired with Open Speed Test, will provide powerful network performance tools to help you validate and or troubleshoot performance, and is something that I feel like everybody should have configured. Finally, since almost everything we went over in this article is a Docker container or has a Docker container that can be used as an alternative, some sort of Docker manager will make your life so much easier. With Docker and Docker Compose, you don't need any tools. You can run containers straight from the CLI, but an application like Portainer or Dockage, which I switched to a while ago, will make that process a lot easier. Either one of them is great, and Portainer will absolutely be the more feature-filled option. But I found that Dockage is a minimal alternative that gives me all the features and functionality that I need without any of the unnecessary features that I had with Portainer, but never really used. Dockage is really a way to manage your Docker Compose file but it provides a lot more features and functionality than that. You can convert your Docker run commands into Docker Compose files, access and view the terminal for your containers, consolidate all Dockage instances into one view so that you can view and manage all of your containers from one instance. I prefer using it this way because when you have a Docker Compose file, you're backing up the configuration of the container. 
Then using a sync tool like we discussed earlier or just backing the volume mounts up ensures that the configuration and the data for those containers are properly backed up and can be migrated to a different container host if you ever wanted to. With all of that said, if you're someone who will use some of those features that Portainer has that other tools don't, use it. I've used Portainer for years and still love it, but I decided to make my setup a little more minimal than it was. Overall, you're gonna be happy with just about any of them. The point is some sort of Docker container manager will most likely make your life easier. And while they're generally personal preference, you should be able to find one that helps manage your Docker containers and makes maintenance and upgrades easier. While I love these services and think that just about everybody can get a lot of value out of them by implementing them, there are a lot of services out there. So I'd love to hear in the comments what you're currently using that I left out and what I could even implement in my own setup. I will leave links to a lot of these tutorials in the description, but if you have any questions, please leave those in the comments. But other than that, if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.